<laughs> Wonderful. Well then, I am here today with I should have asked you if you prefer Alex or Alexander. I think everyone calls you Alexander. Do you have a preference? Yeah, you know, honestly, I really don't, which I know is not a helpful way to answer that question. But I like Alexander in print because it's the same number of letters as my last name, so it looks really good oh, when it's written down. So I think when cool. there's things that I've like applied to or you know they it's always that but you know my friends call me alex or my family calls me alex so <laughs> fantastic well that was the one thing i was like i knew there was something i should have asked you before pressing record and it's it's always if someone's either got a, a surname or a name that's harder to pronunciate or could be shortened i normally try and ask that before so that was that's normally the first question i ask but i got distracted by by your dog and all kinds of other cool things <laughs> but you are here uh because i reached out to you because th- i think the main way people know you is from season one of the Netflix show Blown Away. Uh, And if anyone hasn't watched that, the way I describe it is is almost the pleasantries and not over-the-top showiness of the Great British Bake Off. Just some professionals doing what they want to do without all these crazy, unnecessary, and now it's over the crazy round and balloons come... No, it's none of that nonsense. It's just professionals (laughs) working well and trying to shine a spotlight on that. And obviously you were... You weren't technically a finalist, but you're in the top three, so I'd say you're a finalist. And I think in the glass and blown away community, the fact that you were taken out when you were is quite a controversy because quite a lot of people I've noticed have said, like, and we just, um, me and Megan, we rewatched that ending just to take a look. And we were like, you know, the other contestants did great, but yours was so cool and so different. And I remember in one other podcast, you were like saying, oh yeah, I thought I thought I did something quite well and I was quite confident. And then <laughs> I didn't get through and I was like, uh oh so that's where people know you from so and you've been in other blown away uh, releases like there's a christmas one you've been in and i think you've been in one or two others so you've still got a really good relationship with blown away and obviously that really changed your your life in that way but how would you define yourself obviously in the sphere of job titles and glass blowing and all that sort of stuff when people say who are you without getting too existential <laughs> who are you <laughs> i mean really who are any of us Mike? exactly <laughs> yeah we could get to a whole podcast about that <laughs> that's, that's the question uh well no i usually you know if if i'm uh you know if i'm kind of listing my credentials on something i usually talk to myself as an artist uh educator and a writer and and now i have this kind of ad- administrative role which kind of combines all that stuff where i'm the uh, the glass studio director at wheaton arts which is in millville new jersey so that's that's kind of a nice place to have landed recently is it's kind of a combination of all those those kind of interests Mm -hmm. and do you think like with with blown away in itself obviously that kind of shot you up to a celebrity status that i don't think you would have anticipated and with me not being rude but like I'd never even really thought about glass blowing until Blown Away was on there. Like, I've seen cool glass in places, and I was like, that looks cool. I imagine that's probably done in a factory somewhere, and I imagine (laughs) there are places that probably are. But when I saw the show, I was like, I had no comprehension that that could even happen with glass. So I know that... I'll put links in the description to podcasts you've done in the past where you spoke about, you know, how you got onto Blown Away and where you were at your time of your life when you kind of got into glass blowing and things. But... To strip it right back for us, like myself, who are who know re- no, relatively nothing about glass apart from maybe it's made from sand. I think how how do you make how do you make glass? Like how, and when in the studio, like is there different uh, sands? I, I, some of these things I think I know the answer to, but is there different sands for different colors? Are there different sands for different like uh, textures of uh, the glass you make? Like generally, I know you're a teacher of this, so I'm not trying to get you to come at <laughs> to cram an yeah. entire semester into one sentence. <laughs> but <What? laughs> explain as much as you want, like the method of glass blowing and what the actual thing you do is and the fun name for the uh for the the, the fireplace for all the it. equipment yeah <laughs> well it's like everything you know if you wanted to um you know if you wanted to be in like the place to make all of the innuendos you know like glass glass blowing is the studio for you so you can like reheat in the glory hole and you can like paddle the bottom and you can you know there's uh, always telling people to blow or suck or you know whatever <laughs> it's it, yeah, it makes makes a lot of uh, like twelve year olds giggle or or us <laughs> grown men <laughs> giggle uh, constantly. But yeah, I mean, what glass is 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 pretty interesting. You know, all these kind of seemingly simple questions are, are really, I don't know, are kind of part of what's at the root of like being excited about glass. Um, glass is defined as a non-crystalline solid. Um, 
which is kind of interesting because, or it tells you something about like what the material does uh, when it's cold, um, where, you know, a lot of materials have kind of a structure that you can observe or that you can kind of understand by the way you work with it. You know, so you think about like carving a stone or carving wood, there's, there's like a grain or like a way that it's going to break. That's kind of predictable. And glass doesn't have that. It's unpredictable. Uh, it, it breaks in a very kind of chaotic way and that's also part of the reason why it can be so super super sharp like for example i had um a corrective eye surgery and the blade that cut into the surface of my eye which is like a terrifying and horrible experience (laughs) was made out of glass because it can get like on a microscopic level way sharper than any kind of metal can because of that weird property of how it breaks um but to talk a little bit more about, uh, you were asking about sand. Uh, so yeah, so glass is kind of at its roots, like silica sand, uh, you know, superheated and then cooled. And a lot of people like to think about glass as like a super cooled liquid. So like thinking about it in its liquid state as kind of its natural state. Um, and, and we're just, and then there's this funny kind of piece of apocrypha that's totally wrong, but like, I love it. I love wrong stuff that lots of people think, uh, which is, that if you looked at, you know, really old glass windows, and you'd see that the the window is pane glass is like a couple of microns thicker on the bottom than the top. Some people have said that's because it's still moving when it's cool, even just like really, really slowly. That is, of course, total bullshit. <laughs> it's it's just because people intuitively build like if you're building a structure, you're gonna put the heavy. You know, it's like if you have a pyramid. You put the big side on the bottom, right? Not on the top. It's just like a way how people kind of intuitively build. Um, But it's funny, like asking about what glass is um, and and even your comment earlier about like, well, I don't really think about like people making glass. Like nobody does like, or, or, you know, before this show, nobody did. It's like, I always thought about glass as this very kind of industrial process, like not something that somebody does with their hands. But an interesting thing to me that, that we don't always get to talk about is glass is all, it's also a natural material. Like it's not just something that's industrial. And I actually have this stuff because I was cleaning out, I'm kind of moving between spaces, but I have a collection of naturally occurring glasses. And there's, I won't go through all of them. That's like for the semester long. <laughs> that's for the full <laughs> semester have, thing. You have to pay for the kind of yeah, intrigue. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, if you guys want to look at my Patreon, I have a, <laughs> I have a explainer. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, but one of them is like, totally it's just poetic and amazing and this is the other stuff that's like when you want to be a glass artist like you can look at this this kind of natural stuff and the answers are there already like you don't have to come up with anything you know if you want this like poetry already exists in the world so there is this sea sponge that roots itself on the bottom of the ocean kind of um native to certain parts of japan uh and it grows a glassy uh, like a cage out of its body, like it grows glassy tendril, like its body produces glass and it weaves them. It looks like I can actually grab one for it. It looks like something that's 3d printed. Um, it's this really complicated structure and it's colloquially referred to as a Venus basket. So Mm. check this thing out. It's kind of stuck to the, Oh, wow. And it's glass. And it's glass. It's these tiny little, you can't even see them, but these tiny little hairs that are all woven together. So the thing is beautiful and it's awesome. But then uh, here's the crazy thing about it. There's this tiny algae that likes to live inside this cage once it's made. And then there's a species of shrimp that likes to feed on the algae. So they swim into the cage and they mate. They pick a partner and they're monogamous and they mate. And then they get too big and they can't leave the cage. And then they have their babies and the babies flew them out of the cage. And then the pair is trapped in this cage and they die together. And this is given as a wedding gift traditionally <laughs> in like a certain uh, kind of in a certain place in Japan. That's kind of like a common wedding gift. So um, anyway, that was kind of a, a you know, a long winded response. But there's all this stuff like that that's like. You know, there's extraterrestrial glass that forms like in the stratosphere and comes back down called like a called a tektite and a fulgurite, which people know from the cheesy movie uh, Sweet Home Alabama, which it looks nothing like what's have you seen that movie? I've not. No. 
well, don't bother. It's like, it's <laughs> total garbage, but they have this, it's part of the storyline, but they didn't figure out, or like maybe the, I don't know, maybe the artistic director was like, well, what it actually looks like doesn't tell people enough, you know, about what we want them to know for the movie, but they have this kind of misrepresentation, but it's when lightning hits the sand that's silica rich, it makes a physical shape of lightning out of glass. It's like a tube and you can hold it in your hand. And that to me, it's like, you can hold the shape of lightning in your hand. Like that's, I don't know. That's kind of, that's exciting to me. That's kind of incredible. You know, how else can you be like Zeus? You know, it's nothing. And then regardless of all the weirdness of Greek mythology and all the places he puts his penis, putting that to one side, one of the coolest things I think a lot of us, especially uh, when we were kids, especially because the Disney film I think helped as well, is just being this big, ripply, muscly god with a giant lightning bolt. It's like there's very few things that are cooler than that, you know, apart from maybe, you know, god killers, <laughs> like in God of War, Kratos. Aside from someone killing that guy with a giant lightning bolt, <laughs> that is amazing because the first thing I thought of, and probably the only thing that I could think of that would naturally make glass, is uh, the lightning hitting the sand. So, is it like, if you just picked up sand from a random beach somewhere, could that in theory be turned into glass? Does like relatively all sand have the capacity to be glass if you heat it in the right way? Yeah, I mean, I think so. And, and you know, I you could talk to a real kind of glass scientist who would probably say much more specific things. But like, I, I'm kind of, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I like trying stuff. So like, my especially like in the studio where i work like my approach would be like yeah let's try it out so like you know um we we've made something before here in a tiny little crucible called forest glass where we just kind of take dirt like you know sandy dirt from the ground and put it in a crucible and we can add some other stuff to it to try to because you know commercial glass it does have a mixture of other materials some of them are like fluxes that help it melt at a lower temperature other stuff to help like with a specific color you know, because uh, you were asking about colors too, and a lot of stuff out of the ground will kind of be, um, will kind of be greenish. There's a lot of iron um, will cause a tint. It's like you know, if you take your float glass like from the hardware store and look at the edge of it, it looks green on the edge. That's because like looking through it the long way, it's passing through a lot of material. You can see that that kind of tint. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, the stuff that just comes out of the ground, it just, I guess, you know the more pure silica it is, or if there's a lot of quartz and other things in there, it'll have to melt at a lot higher temperature, um, which is super cool. Like when I was in grad school, there was a lab down the hall from where the glass lab was that was melting moon rocks all day, every day. That was just what they did. And that was a really hot, it was small. I was expecting a really big uh, (laughs) crucible, but it was a very small thing, but they would be melting these moon rocks down at at up to i think almost ten thousand degrees fahrenheit which uh I, I don't know how to do uh celsius on it but it's high it's very <laughs> you do, high you do it the, you do it the wrong way you know you're I, the, I the know. minority where it's like hey uh none of this makes any sense you know celsius is quite quite easy to to figure out but um you say ten thousand fahrenheit in c let's just it's very probably about five thousand right it's probably because uh, it's see, almost yeah like, five and a half yeah. thousand celsius you know yeah. and for clarity on any american listeners um a hundred a hundred celsius is boiling water <laughs> so it's 50 times hotter than what can boil water and if you put boiling yeah. water on your skin you get pretty bad burns so it's it's quite quite hot i'd say <laughs> that's mad like with gla- like with the sand that you get in itself that, that you use in the studio and things like that is it how how does it come about like where where do they get it from if if you know do they is it like for example, does a big truck just scoop something up from the, the beach and then it goes through like this giant sieve? And then like, I assume it's not that. That's like me being silly. But like, how, how does it work? Like, well, well, I think it's two. It's kind of, I'm understanding kind of two questions. Number, like how we get it is like really a manufactured product. We get something mm-hmm. called batch, which is it's, it's powdered and it's mixed perfectly to, to like an exact ratio with, with other materials so we melt it the same every time and it comes out the same every time and it's really wonderful we get it from uh from a place in uh north carolina called spruce pine and they've been making and and the formula that we use is named after dominic labino who was this he was kind of involved in the studio glass movement and he was he was a uh 
you know, he was a material scientist. He was like a glass chemist, basically, who worked in industry, then ended up working with these guys who wanted to like make their own furnaces and make, you know, make individual sculpture stuff, which we're kind of indebted to like glass, uh, as you see it today, like glass art, as you see it today is kind of indebted to this movement into 1960s where like, you know, people decided to, to innovate in a way so that an individual could, you know, could make glass and not like people working in a factory, you know, where there was this, there used to be this kind of, um, more of a division glass would be more of like kind of a design thing. Like you would work as a designer and then you kind of hand it off to the factory to do it. That didn't happen in, this, in one person before. Um, but where the sand comes from is also pretty interesting. I remember I was doing something at this uh, museum in Belgium in Lommel called Glasenhaus. And it, it it's specifically there because one of the main, uh, one of the main uh, exports of that area is is sand and so the museum's there and there's there's like uh rivers there's or, or canals everywhere and they you can see these barges coming back kind of what you described they're just like loaded up with sand that was dug out of a hole somewhere being shipped up up the river to some kind of a processing plant and actually where i am right now this, this in south jersey this is kind of the home of like uh american glass history one of the earliest places where american glass was made and one of the reasons is because this was a place that has a lot of a lot of this good silica rich sand and that so there's like uh silica quarries near nearby here like a five minute drive and they're really beautiful they're just because nothing uh lives in it it's just it's like clear water it's full of water and it's clear and it's these deep holes and it's, it's sand everywhere and pine trees it's like a lunar landscape you know you walk around it's very very pretty that's amazing. And so linking still in with the sand sort of uh, discussion, when it comes to colours, so I noticed uh, in the show, you know, you can see for, for most of it, I think, you know, when you want a red kind of sand, when you want a red glass, it's like a pinky or red-ish kind of sand. Is there like a natural thing that gets put into the sand or is it something really simple like, not, it's not going to be this, but like red food colouring mixed with the sand? <laughs> I assume it's not that simple, but how, how do the colours come about? Uh, you know, I assume it is still in the uh, manufactured sense it's chosen but like how if you if you know that yeah we have and and you have to forgive me or listeners have to forgive me a little bit because i'm not super experienced in like making my own colored glass yeah. but uh but i might be more you know if we talk again i i have some projects coming up that inv involve more of that so i'm kind of learning because you're more of a clear glass guy aren't you a lot of your sort of your favorite things to do especially i think in earlier in your career you really gravitated towards clear glass and now that you're now you're a director and you've been on blown away and all <laughs> stuff you're like i can try out some weird wonderful things you know things out of well, my zone a little bit it's nice that we have this studio here and we invite artists from all over the world to come work here so it kind of um allows me to problem solve in a way that i like that's not necessarily you know because i want to make you know so i say oh well we'll make we'll make you know I, I manage a production uh team as part of the work here so the production team we make a bunch of different stuff and so we melt a tank of colored glass for that so we're kind of mixing mixing the colors and determining like what the next you know what the next color is going to be for whatever we're making um in there but you know to do it it's really in some ways it's kind of complicated but in other ways it's kind of simple it's just like mixing um metals or, or other kind of elements in in with with the glass um so and, and some of them are pretty like you can just know it from the names of the different colors like um cobalt which is a very powerful uh color just a little little bit of cobalt mixed in with the glass will produce this very this blue that everybody really loves this, this very very bright um bright blue uh and um you know i mentioned earlier like iron can make can make green or sometimes red um you know so it's like that but just to be clear you know what you see on tv that's already been manufactured mm -hmm. like in a tank and it's just broken up into sm a small a, a fine uh kind of a fine grit of of crushed up glass that's small enough that you can just roll it onto the surface of the other glass and add it that's like that's the frit which um 
which I think you'll hear me talking smack about it on the, on the TV show. And then of course, you know, and then of course using it and then being criticized for it. So, yeah. <laughs> so in line with that, then when it comes to like the reusability of glass, so if you uh, make something in your studio and you drop it on the floor, cause you know, glass, it's, it's very hardy in, in a lot of ways, but it also, it's also very brittle. It's almost, you know, as long as you drop a glass on the floor, uh, just a drinking glass, and if it lands at the right angle, you're fine. If it lands at any <laughs> other angle, there's pieces on the floor. So if that happens with a project that yourselves are making in the studio and glass a glass smashes on the floor, mm. I would you pick that up and try and reuse it, or would it be like it's contaminated with the dust on the floor so you can't? But yeah. if you could d- get it up pure in a pure sense, could you in theory just melt that down and reuse it or turn it back into that sort of the, the sand kind mm. of stuff again H- how does that work out of interest well first of all that never happens to me so i have no idea you know, <laughs> you've never i'm just kidding obviously um and then the other thing that's like that blows my mind about this if there's any like i don't know physics listeners or something that that want to I, this happens all the time with glass when you drop it in the shop like let's say i'm working making like a sphere or something it, and it drops it will drop from the high height. It will bounce, no problem, land a second time, and then it breaks, falling from a lower height. Why does that happen? I don't know. I can't understand it. Anyway, and I don't. I, maybe it gets like structurally brittle from the first. That would be my guess. I'm no science. Of, just to clarify, my credentials are not science based. So. It's it's just like crazy. You're, you're like you're the first bounce happened. You're like, oh, okay, it was fine, and then it hits again. You're like, oh no, it's over. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, one of the things that's amazing about glass as a material is you could like technically just remelt it over and over again infinitely. It's it's in some ways like you know. But it takes a ton of energy to remelt it. You know, like that's this is very American, but you know, like we don't like to reuse glass bottles. Like the rest of the world likes to reuse. I, I don't know how it is in the UK. Do, do yeah, we, we've got bottles? like a specific. Almost every house in the UK has got like a little plastic bin thing. It's not very mm-hmm. big, and you just put your bottles in there, and then twice a uh, month normally, or once every two weeks, yeah, just oh, there's bottle banks everywhere in a big car yeah. park near a supermarket. There's just a big old metal thing that you mm. put the, the glass in. So yeah, over here, it's I didn't realize it wasn't a thing in America. I know in America, well, it's weird we'll, stuff. We'll, with recycling. we'll recycle them, but in in many parts of the world, they'll wash them and re like return them to the specific manufacturer and use them again. So like South and Central America, for example, you get these bottles. And they're all like worn out around here just from people handling them and getting used over and over again. But Americans in particular, like are obsessed with newness, you know, like we want, like when we buy a product, we want it never to have touched anybody's lips ever before. Peel the plastic off it. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Um, Which is frustrating because like one of the main issues with, with glass and, and kind of sustainability is like, it just consumes so much energy to reuse glass to to melt glass to reuse it but there's a lot of other ways you know there's a lot of other ways that you can uh recycle glass um and there's uh you know and glass is kind of like unpopular uh as as kind of a recycling material because it's heavy it doesn't um resell for very much you know there's a whole market for like recycling materials and collecting them and then selling them to other countries basically um and the markets fluctuate just like any market. So like, you know, you can kind of store stuff, but glass isn't, it's, it's has a lower value than most of the other materials and it's heavier and takes up more space than most of the other materials. So it's kind of like, it's hard to find the, the kind of capitalist uh, re- return on it. But that being said, you know, what we do, we're able to recycle, you know, just in the day to day in the studio, we sort it by color. Um, because just like if you squeeze all the paint out of all your tubes and mix it all together, it'll turn brown. If we do that in a tank with glass, it'll probably turn blue because blue is like the most kind of powerful, um, you know, the, the stuff that goes in the blue makes it most powerful. So we try to separate it where we can, um, in some places where there's like bits of metal or other material, we do have to throw it away. Uh, but for the most part, and especially when it's clear glass, we just chuck it back into the furnace and like melt it over again. So, and you know, because that's the furnace that we're running 24 seven anyway, it's not like, it's not the same as like kind of melting down bottles for a new, you know, a new line of, uh, soda bottles or beer bottles or something like that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with glass in itself, you know, as we kind of touched upon earlier, when most people think of glass, they think of glasses, as in what you drink water out of, you know, glasses that you wear for lenses and stuff, and then windows. I think windows are the big thing. And then when you think about coloured glass, I think most people probably think of like stained glass windows, primarily in churches and, and places of worship. So with what you do, you know, where's the... As a creative and as an artist, you know, before you got into glass and things, you considered yourself sort of a painter, and that's kind of an an, an artist in that way. And glass has kind of been just another avenue for you to uh, express a lot of your uh, artistic talent and things. But with the utilities of glass, and you now have you know being the director of a studio and things like that, and you, you mentioned before about some of the I think selling and things. What with a glass studio in this argument's take like a month? Like, do you make say? a certain amount of things that are like one-off special uniquely made things for Whoopi Goldberg or Sarah Jessica Parker, or is it, you know, his, his 20 really nice fancy windows for this company? Like what do you, what do you actually kind of produce in a glass studio? Cause I would presume that the majority of windows for houses and stuff like that is you, it's just made at a factory, really simple, don't necessarily need a human touch. But I'm, mm. I'm interested where the kind of the difference is for, you know, the, the skill needed to do glass blowing to the level that you do. And then the just given nature that glass is basically everywhere. I'm just intrigued where those kind of lines kind of cross. Yeah, totally. I, those are all good questions. I mean, I think, you know, our studio is unique. This is Wheaton Arts. It's unique in that it does a lot of different things, uh, which are kind of hard to know just by like, looking at the website or walking, you, you know, people do, it's public, we're open to the public. So people walk in and watch us work and stuff like that. But, um, so we do, I'm going to try to remember all of these off the top of my head. Sometimes I mi miss, uh, miss something if I'm just kind of reciting it. But, uh, so we do have a production line, which I mentioned to you. And that's like, we have a team of, it's largely consists of former students of mine from, from teaching, which is just, just fortunate, you know, getting started about a year ago and looking to build the staff that was, a lot of the people that I knew in the community and that were kind of interested in working in this way. And that's, I, I have to say, I think I'm going to come off sounding a little bit like a dilettante, but like, um, I, I don't love working in that way anymore. I'm not sure I ever did. Like, I really like the ability to experiment, you know, different artists want for different things for their artistic practice. For, for me, the most important thing has always been freedom. That's very, also very kind of American. <laughs> so, but it's, it's, you know, rather, you know, rather than like making a lot of money, I would rather be able to make what I want to every day and have it be something different every day, which is, I, I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a luxury and I'm fortunate to have a little bit of that with, you know, what my, the way my current life is. So I, I'm kind of, I, I don't know. I guess I'm conscious of that when I'm talking about this stuff, because I'm not sure, A, that what I'll describe sounds like a winning deal to everybody. Like it might not be what everybody thinks is good. Um, and then some people, it might sound like, I don't know, it might sound like I'm like, don't want to get my hands dirty anymore or something like that. And I, I guarantee you that is not the case. Like there's a lot <laughs> of not glamorous stuff that happens in my day to day. But um so I love that I get to manage this production team. It's actually a really interesting, pr I've never done this before. I've worked production, but I've never done like manage this kind of team on the regular. And it's interesting because it's like designing a product, understanding individual people as part of the process, like specific people, not just any person. So like we're, I'm literally kind of designing objects for the skills of like the five people that are working on the floor uh, every day right now. And like my ability to teach it to them and like how much time it takes. Um, so that's pretty interesting and, and kind of fun. Uh, and, and what I, I like to do, we do a lot, then we do a lot of um, kind of one-off commissions. And this is an interest that I've kind of brought with me from like what I used to do to kind of make a living, but I'm doing more of it out of the studio right now. And this is just like when anybody calls up and says, you know, hey, I want a bottle that's three feet tall or like, hey, uh, can you make I'm talking to this guy right now. I'm sure he won't. I'm sure he won't hear. He he wants us to make from the video game series Fallout. There's mm. something called Nuka Cola. Yes, I love the Fallout. Later, 
versions of it, it look yeah. I love I actually like Fallout 2. In the later versions of it, it kind of looks like a little rocket. Yeah. And he just like random guy got in touch with me uh through the studio and was like, I've found no product in the world that's good enough for like what the vision of this object is that I want. Can I work with you to make it? And so we're doing it. We I we have a a friend of ours, the studio, he he like takes a 3D model and can mill it out of graphite. We make a blow mold and then we can like make this, this object. So like um, that stuff to me is really fun. Like I would love nothing more than to kind of problem solve these weird one-offs, you know, and I get to go in and kind of figure out a weird thing, you know, it's done in a couple months and then we move on to the next thing. That's like a great fun thing. Um, in that vein, we uh, we produce artwork for other artists, for like established artists that are working in other uh, media that aren't necessarily glass makers. You know, it's common. Uh, not every artist for not every artist like making stuff by hand is the central part of everything that they do. And that's I know that can be like a whole other discussion that people have a lot of feelings and ideas about. But it's a reality of the world and, and kind of the industry, you know, the industry that I work in. Um, and I actually kind of love like taking an artist that works, um, you know, that has mastery in something else and they come and, and join you in the studio and you kind of like invent a new language to it's, it's not really a collaboration per se, but there's like moments of kind of collab collaborative, uh, collaboration or, or just like how you learn to communicate, um, across like kind of understanding of material and process is really interesting. So we do stuff like that. We do architectural commissions. There's, um, you mentioned window glass, and that's actually uh, a great one. You know, the the float glass process that makes like the really consistent sheet glass that we're used to. Um, it's relatively new, you know, like a couple hundred years. Uh, and before that, sheet glass was made by hand. It was blown. Um, so one way that it's made is like, by by spinning something out into a plate and then chopping off the edges and it becomes round mm. and it has kind of a ripple to it. You'll see it in old architecture. It's called bullseye glass or people uh, people will call it bullseye glass. So we do like restoration stuff. You know, somebody says, oh, you know, I have a broken window from the early 19th century and we want to replace part of it. It looks like this. Um, we do that sort of thing. Um, we do teaching. So we do ha offer a kind of workshop-based education so it's kind of like we we occasionally will work with a college and do something that that is for credit or degree granting but it's we're kind of more um like kind of a la carte skill-based education you know come take class one class two weekend workshop something like that um and we have uh we have a residency program which is i think my favorite thing that we do here where we invite other artists from all over the world we give them time, space, and money, and free access to the studio, um, and they 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 live here and they just work on whatever they want to work. They kind of experiment, and I, I'm finding that that yeah, like kind of facilitating that is is like one of my favorite things uh, to do here. It kind of gives me access to this international community and kind of like an inter intellectual community. You know, it's just like having other artists around working is is a wonderful way to spend your days. 100% and obviously with your history you go on your website which a link will be in the description and it's like a whole paragraph of all the different residencies you've done so I imagine from the the amount of experience you've had you know pre-blown away and doing a lot of these kind of just here for a couple a month or a few months and here and you've kind of got the taste of all these different skill sets that people can provide and now you're in the position that you can kind of open the doors to those kind of people I mean with artistry, be it in glass, be it in music, be it in anything, really, I always find that collaboration is one of the key ways to develop skills. And so with you, obviously, you've been a teacher for, was it nearly two decades or more than two decades now? Not just um, in glass, but in general, you've been teaching yeah, for not, a while. Yeah, I think not not quite two decades, but more than one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on the lower side, not to insult your yeah. age. It's like, you're, yeah. very, you're still very young. Oh. Um, <laughs> Is like with that element of things, like with you now being a teacher um, or recently in the sort of, especially in the place that you're at at the moment in uh, Wheaton Arts, have you found that, although there's people you've worked with before, because of these residencies, have you found that those people have brought in more intrigue to your own glass blowing? Like have you, you don't necessarily have to name any names, but like if someone comes in and they're amazing at sort of really uh, 
bright colored glass so certain elements or techniques that you've maybe not seen before i'm intrigued by that kind of that element of things of the the collaboration because even when someone is you know a studio director one without any knowledge would think oh you're relatively top of the game especially you've been on you know third in blown away and all kinds of other stuff but i think what people don't understand about really any artist you know unless you're a bit of a dick like kanye west which i think calling him a bit of a dick is probably a bit light on what i would really call him <laughs> <Understatement>. like, <laughs> yeah generally you know un- unless you're a massive asshole you never think that you're at the top of your game ever you're always thinking oh i'm really good at this but there's always a way to improve either you know you're very proficient in clear glass you know i'm not saying you would say you're the best clear glass blower in the world but even if you were You wouldn't be saying that. You'd be like, I'm pretty good at clear glass, but I'm not that great at coloured glass or I'm not great at replicating this thing. So I'm just very intrigued by the that process of just different people coming in with different skill sets on something like glass, which to a lot of the normal people, people don't even know about. So I'm sure there's a lot Mm -hmm. of kind of almost DIY techniques. Someone comes in, you're like, I've never seen it done like that before, but it works. It 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 is. And it's I think it's one of the great gifts of kind of having access to an international community you know j- just to be aware that there's there's more going on makes you a better artist and practitioner you know i i think that anyway you know some people it's funny i was kind of thinking about this conversation that occasionally happens uh with students early on where um we like i i think i mean it is part of education right i think education is kind of like you you learn how to learn and um and part of that is just keeping up on stuff you know like see, seeing what's new you go to all the shows like read the periodicals you know like know what's going on with the other people around you and every now and again early on you'll meet somebody that says well i don't want to look at what else is going on because i'm worried that it will make me unoriginal you know that by by seeing what other people are doing i'll um imitate it you know uh, i'll be influenced by it um and it's it's funny because i mean first of all it, it comes from a place of kind of not intentional but kind of extreme cockiness like you know <laughs> like you're already like a brilliant visionary and the only thing that's going to ruin it is by seeing what other people are doing <laughs> but um you know i think actually you know ending up like if if you end up in a classroom you know you've already walked away from any chance you had to be this kind of um kind of ignorant uh, as a visionary you know i guess like the term outsider artist might not be using it it's like if you like live alone in, in, on a hill and you've never met another person before and you're just kind of coming up with what you're coming up with you know completely unschooled like you don't really have the chance to be that anymore if you've gone to really if you've gone to any school or you've you know been a part of culture um in in most ways a lot of what your subconscious uh, even picks up just walking down the street your yeah. brain processes so much stuff that even if you're not consciously processing it you still it goes in yeah and and i i tend to really believe you know from experience of of, of teaching and just experience of of like making stuff um that it's really quite the opposite it's like the more that I know about the thing that I'm interested in and the more other people that I know about that are kind of working in a similar way, uh, you know, it's almost like I get to springboard off all those other people's research or all those other people's experience and work I can use as a starting point, you know, just by having read about it or seen what it is. And I can go farther, like I can get farther um, than I would have if I were just trying to kind of work it out on my own. Um, So that's to say, you know, it's funny because glass is like glass blowing anyway, which I think is unique uh, in other arts it, uh, uh, to, to other glass arts. It's really sporty like, which is funny because like I don't think of myself as like an athletic type of person. And I've never really liked, you know, I don't I don't like watching sports on on TV. I'm I don't saying. find it interesting. Yeah, <laughs> so it's but it turns out that like the really main aptitude that I have is like learning that happens in my body, which is unusual. There's not, there's not a lot of ways to talk about what that is in terms of like intellect, you know, we talk or, or uh, knowledge and intellect. Um, it, Cause it's, it's, it's weird. It's harder to measure. It's, it's harder to understand, but that's the type of learning that I do best. Um, and, and it's the really the only type of thing I think that kind of, 
um, you know, kind of, I can stand out from the crowd on, you know, I wouldn't be a better like mathematician or accountant or historian. Um, uh, but so that in my mind is the only place where this idea of like being the best lives it. Cause it's like this kind of athleticism, you know, like, can I do it faster or bigger or, you know what I mean? There's this kind of a action to it. Um, but like, there's no being better than other people at, being an artist because like you create the kind of problem and then solve it yourself or you create like the language and then master it you know like you kind of create this set of rules and that those could be like in conversation i guess with somebody else you know uh but um yeah i don't know i think early on obviously like everybody gets to where they are from imitation i love that too actually i was thinking about that i i was thinking about how so many people like invent the kind of artist that they are by trying to imitate someone they admire and failing, you know, and then like doing their version of the thing that they wish they could try to do from somebody else becomes their thing, you know, that they realize they can't be this person, but they kind of find out something about themselves and they lean into it. I don't know. It's wonderful. This is the stuff that I love of teaching, like watching people kind of uncover this unexplored version of themselves, you know, in, in front of your eyes. It's kind of exciting to me. Um, so that being said, um, yeah, I mean, you know, there, there is like kind of competitive -y stuff in the glass studio or in like glass culture. I think it's a little bit, um, I think it's old school. I think it's like kind of macho, like white male kind of, um, you know, like kind of, yeah, like, like kind you, of... Not like you're soft, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was the... Yeah. <laughs> you, <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know what that means. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, I think there... It, but I think that's something that we're, like, all collectively moving away from now, you know, to, to, I think, like, kind of a more inclusive culture that I think also, like, makes everybody better for it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, I guess that kind of wandered a little bit, but I do think the more, and we're able to be aware, like even from the time that I started making glass to now, it's so much easier to know, like, you know, there's a video. If if you want to know how somebody made something, there's a video of it. You can just like write it into the box and I can like kind of see how somebody does something. Um, so there's a lot of people, uh, you know, everybody has access to so much more. And I think everybody's much, much better. I think everybody's just much, much better at glass, you know, than they might've been 20 years ago. Cause I guess that's about the amount of time since I've been doing it. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I, I know from other conversations that you've had and for people who are not aware of the, the soft bro thing, that was not an insult. That's a reference to another <laughs> podcast that Alex is on. So just to clarify to anyone, um, I'll put links in the description to the other pods that I've listened to Alex on. But one thing I, I made note of is, and, he, and you mentioned it just then, is <clears throat> you have this ability of, for lack of a better word, you know, kind of picking up things by a physically doing them it's like the kinetic energy you're definitely mm. a kinetic learner more so than a visual or an auditory learner and you mentioned that what you really enjoyed is if you do something in air quotes perfectly especially if it's uh with glass blowing because of the age of glass blowing and it's like you know realistically it's millennia old but what happened is kind of as civilization grew and then the industrial revolution happened a couple hundred years ago and even my less extreme versions of the industrial revolution happening throughout history glass bone became more of just it's an industrial thing it stopped being such an art form and then you mentioned you know in the sort of the mid-1900s it kind of had a, a renaissance in a sense and with your mention of kinetic learning it's you you mentioned that when done perfectly this kind of a certain way of doing it you feel very connected to people from the past i, I just wonder if you could explore that just a little bit because i thought it was such an interesting concept yeah, I mean, I think with glass, it's like, you know, this, I think this exists in a lot of other kind of um, hand work, you know, especially with kind of long craft traditions. But I think um, glass in particular, like you think about the, the past when you're doing it, just because like, it's so archaic, like there's nothing really, you know, I'm using these tools that somebody like hammered out of metal on a forge and like, 
those have been made the same for, you know, hundreds, maybe sometimes the thousand. They, they didn't have jacks a thousand years ago, but, you know, some, some of the tools. Um, uh, so there is this kind of constant thought about it, like, um, you know, like, well, like, how exactly did they do this? You know, you're like looking at an old object and he's saying, and this is before being able to like see a video of, you know, whoever is, is making it. And then so you kind of wonder, and it's like an event, you know, because making this stuff, it's a performance. It's like a series of movements you do with your body. And I guess that's what you're wondering, like, or at least for me, like when I'm wondering how this object was made, you know, I'm envisioning a person and like how they moved and what it would have looked like, you know, some, what I'm trying to imitate. And um, I don't know, it's just such a weird thing to be trying to like perfectly match the movements of somebody that I've never met, you know, that I can never talk to, that I have no idea, because there's also no authorship on these objects. Like, you know, this is before the studio glass thing that we were talking about. People don't, the guy in the factory that like put the last bit on doesn't sign his name on it. You know, like it was made by this factory and that's that's kind of that's kind of the thing. Um, and and I love that. There's a lot of that in my work um, where I'm kind of trying to find closeness, like an impossible closeness or like connection with a person uh, that it's that it would be kind of hard to hard to know or hard to interact with or hard to be close with. Um, and I'm not 100 percent sure really like where that comes from. I do think it's kind of built into the medium and maybe just like you know, trying to do, doing this like practice and repetition and thinking about this stuff all the time, but it's in other stuff too. You know, there's a, um, there's a project that you've seen, we were talking about it. That's, it's still kind of one of my favorite things that I've done just cause it was such a totally bizarre thing where I was kind of doing rock climbing on the outside of a 19th century prison in Philly. And one of the things about that project, you know, it's not a, really a glass project at all, but one of the things about this project is like, me getting to move with my body, something that people imagined for like, you know, dozens and dozens of years, like all these different people, because anybody that was incarcerated in this space, you know, would have been looking at that wall and like imagining the thing that I was kind of ultimately performing. Um, so I don't know, there's something about that, that kind of like fantasy or longing or like thinking about something and then kind of enacting it. Um, that's always that's always been kind of appealing appealing to me mm -hmm. and does that link in with one of the things i appreciate about you and <clears throat> excuse me one of the things that i appreciate about you and one of the things that both myself and megan we were drawn to when you were on blown away it was like you were we were gunning for you the whole time and then obviously you still did a really great job in that but one of the things we really enjoyed was the personality that you put into that but also there's a degree of introspection, I think, because obviously blowing glass is an art form at the end of the day, but much like any art forms, you know, you could spend your entire life making identical glass bottles, which people could in theory do, or you can try and do different things, which as we've, as we've already discussed, you know, you try and do different things, try and challenge yourself, and you quite like making one-off pieces that are very unique as opposed to 20 of the same thing that makes you more money. So how does your own introspection kind of bleed into glass blowing i know that obviously we've blown away there's certain things that you've shown which you well more than welcome to use examples of that if desired but it's just a very intriguing because I, I love hearing about people's artistic sort of output but with glass blowing it's not spoken about as much so i just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your own introspection when it comes to blowing glass well yeah i mean i think um well, okay. I think like technically I I've found, and it's like glass and other things. I found that again, like part of this, this kind of freedom and studio practice that I'm excited about. A lot of times it ends up with me um, spending time with a person like an expert and learning something from them that I couldn't learn from anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, that to me falls under the category of like, you know, it helps make a good project, but it also helps me like have a good life. That's the kind of thing. That's the way that I like to spend my time. I was realizing that I was kind of like debriefing from a residency that I did recently that you've, you've heard about uh, where it was called recycled artisan residence or is that like, it's the construction waste dump in Philadelphia basically. And we were kind of spending a lot of time there. And, um, and it was like field work really. Like I was spending time in the kind of, yard 
with people that work there and knew how to navigate it and like learning how to, how to do that. And I think that's, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's like a big part of, I'm realizing that that's like a big part of what, what I like to do is like have a hard thing and spend a lot of, a lot of time and resources, like kind of learning it, um, learning it kind of intimately so that I can kind of use, you know, kind of process it and use it to show people, um, I guess kind of to show people about, uh, to show people something through like a, a unique lens, you know, through a way that like you couldn't see the world without having gone through, you know, I kind of like put myself through that and then I'm able to show people something that you wouldn't have been able to see unless you had gone through it. Um, which, uh, you know, it's hit and miss. It's not always, not always everybody. I, I remember um, presenting some work to a class full of students and somebody raised their hand and was like, does anybody ever tell you that your work is like masturbatory? <laughs> and and I was like, what, well, this is someone telling me that right now. Would you, like, <laughs> would you like to tell me more about that? And I think, um, you know, so I guess there's this assumption that there's like some value to kind of seeing the world, you know, uniquely through like through kind of a single perspective or, um, you know, or, th or that it's, it's somehow generous, which I understand maybe it's not for everybody, but um, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of part of the assumption, but um, I don't know. I do think, I, I think it's valuable for work to be sincere or like, I think I've tried to make work that um, is like serious in a way that I think it should be, but it was disingenuous and it doesn't really work out for me. So I think, just kind of genuinely representing like my interests or the things that are important to me or like, um, you know, people sometimes ask about like, it, there's kind of some humor in, in lots of the work that I do. And like, I'll give a talk and people are laughing and they'll ask about like the humor. And I'm like, well, it just turns out I'm like, not really that serious of a guy, you know, what I mean? <laughs> like if I tried to make a talk that was all about, I don't know, some really deep, dark thing that I thought, you know, that I thought everybody should know about, it probably wouldn't really be like kind of an accurate representation of like, um, you know, how I'm kind of seeing or, or processing the world. So um, I'm not sure if that starts to kind of answer some of those questions, but. Um, <laughs> the, the, it's more, they're more just jumping off points <clears throat> to be able yeah. to hear you sort of explain the process because where it's, where it's still quite an uncommon art form and things. And, it's one of those weird things that is just becoming very apparent with this conversation is just like how how integral glass is to life like i don't think if anyone is listening to this uh podcast um or watching on youtube you probably can't look anywhere and you can't see some form of glass your your smartphone has got glass your drink if you're drinking at home you've probably got a glass you know all computers there's a degree of glass that either makes the screen or certain parts within it as well if you're in a car obviously windscreen and all kinds of so it's like it's one of those strange things that i feel like almost it's almost like bg and ag before glass and after glass is when you kind of have this glass awakening and you start to kind of because even with the run-up to the conversation with you when i was listening to other uh conversations you've had i was just like i was just walking around and looking at random things and i was like the, you, it, certain things you think an industry may just a robot's done it you know not as exciting but just the how much glass is everywhere and how little it's talked about like the un mm. the thing everyone basically knows about glass is that it's fairly brittle it's made from sand and if it breaks don't go near it you know right. brush it up and get <laughs> it away they're just the three things you're told about glass and that's pretty much it like no one in school at least there's no history of glass to my knowledge there's probably a few universities that probably have certain uh subjects you could take but it's not in the, like, the standard curriculum mm. of you know in science we learn about physics and in physics you will have a whole thing about glass or in mm. history there's no history of glass making even though it's so intertwined with religious organizations and just buildings being made and obviously the industrial revolution mm. so i'm just finding like it, it's very intriguing to me with that and obviously with yourself where you found glass you know many moons ago not so many moons ago though not too many but a few <laughs> moons ago uh the you, you're, you know the story goes you know and i'll put the links to the podcast so you kind of explain it more but you know you basically get a roommate um and they basically come back with this glass thing they made and that kind of turns you on to, to glass in a way so since you started making your own glass 
has that really changed your perspective of other elements of the world and has that impacted like i know you've always been artistic but has glass blowing also made you want to try more woodworking stuff or has it mm-hmm. kind of been the thing of the opposite it's like i do this for a living now i don't want to do any hands-on stuff in my free yeah. time yeah i mean one thing that i love is like and this is i guess it's kind of a teaching thing but it's also kind of an artistic practice thing is like um i think glass is such a great thing for people to learn about like mastery in general because it's just so freaking hard like it's you know i've done a lot of different things i don't claim really to be an expert or a master at any of them but i can tell you that like glass is among the hardest things that i've ever tried for some reason like an idiot i decided this would be the one that i would really kind of (laughs) um focus on but you know what what it kind of takes to continue uh along that road it really teaches you kind of how to teach yourself mastery of other things um so one of the things that i i like to think about in fact i was just uh, there was an article just published by a colleague, a friend and colleague of mine named David Schnuckel, great name, and uh, in the Glass Art Society newsletter, where he's talking about, he's talking specifically about people who work with glass but make stuff that's not glass. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like so clearly informed by a glass making uh, kind of knowledge that it's still kind of glass art. It's just the glass is missing. Um, and that's that's one thing that I think about a lot. I think about you know, what is it for somebody to do like woodworking or metalworking in like a glass, in a glassy way, you know, like using kind of the knowledge and the skills that uh, we have in this thing. In fact, I had a great experience. I got to work with this. um, He's kind of an internet celebrity, much more than me, internet celebrity, this guy, Amari Guichon. He's a, a, like a pastry chef and he makes all this stuff out of chocolate that looks like it's perfect, real giant chocolate stuff. He's got like a crazy Instagram following and he has a school in uh, Las Vegas. His And anyway, his, he and his wife came out and they took a glass class. It was really fun. And one of the things that was awesome was he had worked with blown sugar before and he could use his knowledge of like what he had done with the sugar to kind of figure out how to do stuff with glass, like, for, you know, just based on uh, based on that kind of stuff. So um so I like to do everything. I mean, like I said, I kind of, I feel like I, I maybe I didn't say it in this di- direct, uh, direct of a way, but like, I think glass has opened up to me this idea of an art practice that just involves like picking really weird, esoteric, challenging stuff and kind of teaching myself it or learning it from somebody who's experienced as kind of like, that's kind of what the art practices or on my best days, you know, that's kind of what the art practice is. But, um, but I don't know, like talking about seeing glass in the world, like, I, we, so there's a brilliant historian that I work with named Mary Mills. She's kind of like the the scholar, the, the one of the leading scholars on early American glass. And when she talks about like how to understand the historic significance of glass, you know, like the stuff that from the 19th century that you're digging out of the dirt, um, she says, OK, think of everything that's plastic and then imagine that's gone. You know, because we didn't, that wasn't until the middle of the century, that wasn't really like plastics wasn't really a big thing. So anything that we see all all the time used every day in plastics, that would have been glass too. You know, Um, now we have, as you, as you so kind of aptly mentioned, all this technology stuff. And um, it is like really at the heart of every technological advancement, which I know is something that I kind of talk, that's like a talking point for me, but like, it is kind of crazy. Like if you look at the history, if you look at the history of technology or, you know, the history of how we see the world, you know, anything that's like really far away, anything that's teeny tiny, anything that's like super fragile or anything that's kind of like reactive. um, That was all, you know, all the way that we've kind of developed our ability to kind of observe the natural, natural world has been through this material. And, uh, and as you said, like this kind of, age of connectivity like you know you and me are talking and it's going through fiber you know it's light going through fiber optic glass cables like under under the atlantic ocean yeah and we can have like this conversation in real time and we look at each other through i don't know if my screen is glass because this is kind of a cheapo laptop but (laughs) you know there's definitely glass in the lens of the of the camera that's looking at me um yeah so i don't know all those things are kind of exciting 
but you know, like I, I came to glass just cause like I tried it and I liked it, you know, I was curious and I tried it and I liked it. And I just got lucky that it like happened to be about all this stuff that I thought was like really cool too. I probably wouldn't have stuff. I guess I don't really know, but if it was like not really about anything that maybe I would have just done it as like a sport or a hobby or something like that. But, um, it is really wonderful, you know, that kind of, I don't know, like kind of material and conceptual synthesis when there's like a thing that is about all this stuff, like that, you know, the glass itself is inherently about all this stuff. Like, it's like what I was saying about the natural glass. Like you don't have to, I don't have to say, I'm going to make a giant hamburger. You know, some people, (laughs) or I don't know, maybe that's a bad example. I'm going to make a giant purple dinosaur, you know, like that's cool too. But there's all this stuff that like the glass is about, you know, that we can make glass about what it's about. You don't have to kind of say, I'm going to make a bit, you know, I'm going to make a giant hawk holding, holding an AK-47. I think that'd be quite impressive to see so big that a glass. That'd be very difficult. You know, if you, you knew you should get that project together, do that. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll, call, I'll call him up after this. <laughs> do you have a podcast? This guy had the best idea. Let's do a hawk with an AK-47. You knew should be like, what are you talking about? You see some of his work. Like, he'd, be, he'd, he'd be like, I told you to stop calling here. Like <laughs> Late night calls of random yeah. glass projects. It's enough. Um, yeah. But linking in with that, we'll start to wrap up here. But it's quite it's quite funny and ironic that glass can be used in a sense to as a framing device for almost anything. And the ironic part is that a frame classically has a pane of glass in front of it mm-hmm. to protect it. So it's just one of those funny things where I imagine you could probably write an entire book of poetry all to do with glass puns, but actually linking him with truly <laughs> philosophical things because it's just ever like seeing things through a certain lens. What's a lens made out of? Glass. Frames, mm-hmm. glass, window, glass. Like all these things that you use quite commonly metaphorically in literature, they're all made from glass. And it's the one thing I think if you went back to, you know, Neanderthals or sort of Homo erectus, those sort of things, like they had fire. You know, one of the leading theories as to how uh apes uh, brains increase in size so much there's lots of different theories i like all of them stone ape theory weapon (laughs) theory and throwing arms and stuff like that but fire and you know eating cooked meat i think is quite a big leading theory because the nutrients Mm. uh, they got from it and things and it's like in theory although there's natural occurring glass anyway you know because of the main example i think of is lightning hitting sand but in theory from the discovery of fire that could have been as soon as humans started making things out of glass you know obviously we know that yeah forges whenever people think of like fa- like history or fantasy stuff you always think of swords mm-hmm. and you go and swords and shields and armor and stuff it's like, well how is that made where well, you get metal you superheat it and then you use that to shape it in certain ways and use the cooling practice it's like but that's that's what you do with glass it, it's mm-hmm. every, every basically however long humans have been able to meld metal we've also been able to meld glass which is a really bananas thing to think that basically since the dawn of fire yeah in theory is basically since man-made glass could have actually been a thing but the 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 irony and the the tragedy of it all is that glass is one of the most perishable objects (laughs) on the planet so you put a glass on you actually drop a glass outside in a garden and you have enough people step on it eventually after probably the 12th 15th person and you do a bit of scuffing you get the 13th person out they won't even be able to find the glass right maybe a couple of shards you just think over however many years and how glass reduces down to sand or lack of a better word or the tiny shards it's just one of those kind of crazy things that i've just kind of come to just thinking about speaking with you about well, it you, you know the the and again i don't know you know not being really a, a historian myself but like the kind of apocrypha is it a lot of people think that maybe the first people making glass were the Phoenicians. And the story is that they're, you know, traveling by by boat on river and, and stop on like a sandy bank to have a have lunch. And they make a big fire to have their lunch. And maybe they let it get a little out of control, you know, because fire, uh, or you know, they let it go for a long time. And and at in the base of the fire, they have the, the sand has melted and they, that's kind of the starting point so i mean it's it's really you know according to that anyway it's like exactly what you say somebody somebody just made a big fire and found a puddle of stuff at the end and then and then somebody was audacious enough to say i I wonder if i could like you know make that 
into something. And that's like, you know, I want to know who that guy was. <laughs> was like, or know more about that for say, oh man, that's crazy Susie. She's always, you know, she's always coming up with these projects that, you know, they, they never work out. And, um, but yeah, it's, you know, and then so they, the invention of, well, I mean, this is like a whole other different conversation, but, you know, huge in glass uh, technology was the invention of the punty. And that's like, that's like mind blowing to me. And the punty, and punty? For, for people yeah. listening is like, if I'm making this, mm-hmm. um, you know, it starts as a bubble that's closed on this end and attached to a pipe. So I can kind of make this cylindrical shape and I can flatten it here. And then I have to s- attach a little piece of glass on another pipe to the end there, break it off the other one and finish it by opening it up and then be able to have that pop off clean. And that's like, you know, it's it takes years just to even be able to be any good at just doing it. I can't imagine coming up with that, you know. Uh, it's just, I don't know. It's just amazing. Mind boggling to me. It's true. It's, it's well, especially with glass, that is something so temperamental and something that is so, you know, when you think, imagine if the first person who ever did it, did it, you know, 150,000 years ago, let's argue. But then it was so hard and they were like, this is <laughs> yeah. impossible. Like, we're, I'm just going to save up. that. And then like, <laughs> like 20,000 years later, yeah, someone else tried it. And maybe there's just one, as you say, just crazy person who's just like, <laughs> I think there's something here. And everyone's like, right, just carve wooden cups. Why would you use this glass stuff? <laughs> yeah, it we takes have you boards, hours like to make. grow out of the ground. Yeah, you we, just let it dry. Like, it's the or easiest thing. Pouches. I have this. Yeah, this cow bladder, it's perfect. This goat bladder, you know, what a, come on. What, like this transport stuff and has a lid. Why would you want to carry around this brittle thing? You know, you can use it as a weapon. Like, and it's like, why would you use glass as a weapon? You've got this sword made of metal. It, it's it's one of those things that would be, I've often thought before, it's like, uh, either what happens when I die, I'd love to think I have just had access to all conceivable knowledge and they're the kind of crazy things I'd go back to. Or if you could have like a... Um, like a magic, uh, like a crystal ball, and you could just say, "What actually was Jesus like? You know, what was he? Can I actually see literally in the? You know, I'm not a, a religious individual, but in the Bible, Jesus's life seems to be when he's a kid, and then it just kind of jumps, and then it's suddenly all the main parts. I'm like, what was he doing? He had this awkward period where he was kind of a dick to everybody. <laughs> yeah. They leave that out. He yeah. really, you know, he really kind of came into himself later on. But he's kind of a jerk. Jesus is angsty years. years. Yeah. <laughs> when he had the long hair, but it was all black. As yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. But I'd love to see like how glass first came about. You know when? Because yeah. as you say, like it's so hard and so complicated nowadays. You can't really fall into making glass you can kind of have the opportunity but you, you really have to commit you can't like i imagine this will probably be the, the last sort of question i assume mm. there's potentially people have an aptitude for glass blowing but i assume there's no one who's just come in that you've experienced Never. who's just like and it's i'm it's amazing like my, suddenly yeah it's my favorite thing about it is like um you know because like I don't like this idea. I actually don't really like the idea of talent at all. Mm. Um, I know that certain people have like advantages to certain things. You know, people are uh, have rich parents, or you know, like um, are are particularly uh, good with numbers and figures. You know, there uh, I know people have different kind of advantages, but glass is one of these amazing thing. It's a kind of an amazing equalizer, mm. like everybody sucks at it the exact same amount in the beginning like every single person you know professional uh professional sports players you know i got a uh a chance to uh hang out with steven weatherly he was like uh, a football american football player who's into glass i met him at a studio in um uh uh you know minneapolis and uh such a really nice guy i was like really surprised and i don't follow sports at all so i was like well, there are all these really tall athletic guys here. Like, I don't know what their deal. And then somebody was like, Oh, they're, they're Minnesota Vikings. They're, you know, they're hanging out with you. Um, but you know, sucks at, sucks at glass just as much as any, you know, a brilliant athlete, like just he does amazing, amazing things on the sports ball field. <laughs> um, but you know, no advantage in this. Um, you know, the, I've, occasionally like when you teach a beginning class there's a couple things that people if you're like a chef or you're a hair uh dresser or hair Mm -hmm. cutter um they can pick up fast because you have to do two different things with two hands 
So people that already do two different things with two hands, it's a little easier to flip that switch. But everybody makes the same like globby bullshit. And <laughs> and it's true that like, in fact, this is a good kind of tie in back to the stuff about the show. Um, you know, on the reality show, they'll always have people like somebody that's like, yeah, I've been doing this for five years. And there's somebody that's like, yeah, I've been doing this for 30 years. The person doing it from 30 years will always do better than the person doing it for five years. I know there's some hope maybe in the mind of the producers and the mind of the viewers at home that there could be this like prodigy or just like raw talent, but it just doesn't work that way with class. It's like the person who does it the long, the longest gets the best, better at it. And I love that. I love that, that like, if, if you can figure out a way, and I understand that to get that can sometimes require some kind of advantage, you know, to get the access or to get mm -hmm. the ability to practice more. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you can figure out a way to do it, just spend more time on it, you know, you'll end up, uh, you know, everybody, everybody can do it the same. Everybody <laughs> can be just as good. That's amazing. That's a really nice way to sort of wrap things up. Because yeah, it's, it's one of those I looked at that and I was like, I can't see like I, I've had the the talent thing as a whole. I could do a whole podcast on talent and the idea of it because I think apart from maybe singing, singing is the one thing I think that you can get better as a singer. But I just think no no matter how hard I try, I cannot sing like Freddie Mercury. It's, it's, it's a physical impossibility for me to be that good. But mm. I'm a pretty rubbish singer. But with the lessons and stuff and technique, I could be an okay singer. But I think yeah, singing, you can hit the notes at your range. Yeah. You, but you know, you can't be six inches taller either. You know? Exactly. Yeah, it's like that. yeah, it is one yeah. of those things. But I, I do agree with. You. There's a lot of things with talent. You know, where people, some people say to me because I I do all my own editing. I obviously organize these conversations, do my own notes, I do all my own graphic design artwork, and they go, God, man, you're really good at that sort of stuff. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I kind of did it out of necessity. I didn't just wake up one day and suddenly I was good at graphic design. I was like, I'm not paying someone to make a logo for me. <laughs> I just need to kind of know how to do it. And because I had a vague interest in it in, uh, in my pro, in like my, I did an apprenticeship where I worked at a cassette place, cassette production and CDs, and I just did a bit of graphic right. design there. And I was just like, this is quite cool. I, I'm okay with Photoshop. I did it in media studies a little bit. And then I just mm. kind of fostered that. And it's like, I didn't just fall into this, you know? And with glass blowing, it's like, yeah, you literally can't. You you, you have no hope. <laughs> if you fall anywhere near glass, it will break. And that's a great little metaphor. So, Alex, is there any sort of, I'll put uh, details in the show notes of some of the things you've mentioned and your website, your Patreon and your social media. But any last things that you want to say uh, to any of the listeners before we wrap up? And any, if there's anything that you want to plug that I haven't already mentioned, now is your time, good sir. Oh, man. I should, well, you know, it, I would just say uh, come down and visit. If you're in the, um, you know, northeastern United States, South Jersey region, I, you know, I work at it. Where I work now, it's like, it's also my, my studio. So if, if, I don't know, if you're like a fan or a person interested in glass, you should come down and visit. Sometimes I'm there working on the floor. It's, uh, it's just fun to meet people that are also interested in this sort of thing. Um, I should say, I guess I have a class that I'm going to be teaching in May. So mm -hmm. keep an eye out for that. And um, I don't know, we had a nice, uh, I I'd co-curated a group show at the Delaware Contemporary, which is no longer there. So you can't go see it, but there was a really nice review of it in the last quarterly magazine. I think that's, I think those are the highlights for right now amazing yeah and i'll put links you know your your instagram is a good place to keep up to date with a lot of stuff there's something you made a week ago which when this comes out probably be a month ago but it was a really cool terrarium that i just loved i thought that that was phenomenal and uh, megan loves terrariums she makes terrariums and things like that so you know all, just look on your instagram is really cool you know if you want to support alex and his amazing things support him on patreon it's there's so many cool things over there and you can, if you go at the right tiers you can actually uh, get discounts on some of the things in his little shop so you know l loads <laughs> of reasons to do it you know and it's just really fun being able to see someone who is so passionate about glass and you to speak with someone like yourself. And I'm just saying to people, yeah, check out your website. There's lots of cool elements of things that you've been involved with over the years. You've done quite a few podcasts, you, loads of ways to figure out things about you. So just, you know, uh, I'll chat with you a little bit when I stop pressing record. But just, you know, thank you so much for coming on the show and making time for me and my audience because I know they're going to love it. Oh, thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, let's do it again. Love to. And that's the end of the episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, my friends, as I said in the intro, make sure you check out the links in the description. There's loads of information, including Alex's website, where you can look at a lot of the cool stuff he's made. And his Instagram is incredible. He posts on there quite frequently. So make sure you check that out. And obviously check out season one of Blown Away on Netflix to see Alex in action. 
But what else is going on in the genuine chit chat sphere? Obviously, the last few weeks, I've had a lot of conversations surrounding religion. And also, I spoke with Kevin Shinnick, the Star Wars author. But what have we got on the horizon? Well, I've got a conversation recorded with Rick Ives, who has recently created an independent feature film called Solid Rock Trust. And he sent me a screener for that. So I've seen that and we discussed that movie, as well as some of the other projects he's worked on. He is actually an assistant editor at Marvel Studios and has worked on a huge amount of the Disney Plus shows for Marvel and lots of other cool things there. So make sure you tune into that. That's probably going to be next week. And I have a conversation due for recording this week with an author who tackles some very serious subject matter. There will be some trigger warnings coming your way, but I'll give you a little bit more information on that once I've actually got that recorded. There are also plans to do Disney discussion number six. That is going to be in the next month or so. But in addition to that, myself and Megan are going to Star Wars Celebration, which is in under two weeks. And when I go there, I'm going to be hopefully speaking to a couple of people there. But in any case, myself and Megan will be recording in our hotel room each evening to talk about what we've seen and some updates on those sorts of things. So if you're a Star Wars fan, make sure you look out for those. In addition to that, still linking with Star Wars, you can check out the weekly Mandalorian discussion shows that I've been doing on the feed of Comics in Motion, and you can also watch the video versions at Genuine Chit Chat's YouTube channel. I always recommend people subscribe to the YouTube channel, not just because it helps me out, but also because if you're new to the show and you want to kind of delve deep into some of the other episodes, I've put things into genre playlists, so it's really easy to navigate the kind of conversations that you want to hear. All my episodes of Star Wars Comics in Canada are on there, all the Mandalorian discussion shows are on there, plus some other discussion shows I've been a part of, and loads of other great things too, so please consider consider going to see that. In addition, you can see my Star Wars show, Star Wars Comics in Canon, both on my YouTube channel and on the feed of Comics in Motion, where you never have to have read a single Star Wars comic or book or anything like that in your entire life. I've created the show specifically so that newcomers and veterans can enjoy the Star Wars show. Basically, I go through the plot details of a Star Wars comic, and along the way, I give you more information on bits of trivia I find interesting. There's some out-of-universe things, but primarily it focuses in-universe, such as characters that reappear, planets I find interesting, species, those sorts of things. So it's a perfect way to expand your knowledge on the Star Wars canon. Last couple of bits, you can sign up to the Pop Culture Collective newsletter that I'm a weekly contributor for, and over there you get updates on all of my content that I release both on Genuine Chit Chat, Star Wars Comics and Canon, and anything else I am up to, and you also get to hear from loads of other amazing creators. It's a perfect way to support the show, get updated with everything that's going on, without having to follow me on all the social media places, as well as some of the other incredible individuals, most of whom have been on this show. Speaking of social media, you can follow me at Genuine Chit Chat on Instagram, Twitter, and on Facebook. I generally post the same sort of things across each of them. Facebook's probably the thing I use the least, but on there I post snippets of Genuine Chit Chat episodes. There's images that come from my Star Wars comics that I speak about in Star Wars Comics and Canon, and a few other bits and pieces that I get up to. I recently did some laser tag for my birthday, and there'll probably be some photos from Star Wars Celebration and those sorts of things too. So it's a great way to keep updated with myself, especially because on my Instagram stories when I go out and do stuff, I normally update those. And the other ways you can support Genuine Chit Chat obviously is by subscribing on a podcast app or on YouTube. But in addition to that, you can leave reviews on iTunes, Good Pods, or any of those sorts of apps. You can rate it on Spotify, and also you can become a Patreon supporter. So for as little as £1 a month, or $1.50 I think it is, you get access to a whole host of audio-exclusive episodes you can't find anywhere else. So there's currently over 160 episodes of Afterthoughts. I release at least one of those once a week. There's over 10 Star Wars Legends book reviews on there. But the main thing we do on there is myself and Megan give reviews on TV shows shows we've seen or movies and there's a very wide berth of things we recently re-recorded our thoughts on goonies as well as blade runner 2049 drive we also do reviews of like live performances like we've seen the great british bake-off musical we've seen the book of mormon a couple times lots of great things like that and normally when we go on road trips or go on holiday things like that we also record our thoughts there too so please consider checking that out if you also want to get early access to certain genuine chit chat episodes as well as some other bonus content and you get access to this audio exclusive feed with hours and hours and hours of additional content and you support the show But friends, that is enough from me. So thank you so much for listening. As always, I appreciate each and every one of you, especially when you listen all the way to the very end. I'll speak to yourselves next week, likely with my conversation with Rick Ives, or maybe with the conversation I've got recorded with the other person, but it's probably going to be Rick. But thank you so much for listening as always, and I'll speak to you next week.